Hi everyone. I'm Melissa Wilson, Vice President Business Development with Tranquilo. I'm so excited to be live today with Rebecca Dixon, General Manager of Mommy Bites, talking about infant sleep in the first year. Thanks so much for joining us, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yay. I'm pretty sure that being a mama three qualifies you as an expert. But in addition to being a rock star mom, I mentioned Rebecca is a general manager of Mommy Bites. She's responsible for securing experts for classes, collaborations with brands, strategic planning, and business development. Before Mommy Bites, Rebecca worked in the media advertising industry for eight years following her graduation from Vanderbilt University. She co-founded BE Designs, a fashion design and marketing company. She's the co-chair of the Brooklyn affiliate of Horizons, an educational enrichment program serving low-income public school students. Rebecca, her husband, and three kiddos live in Greenwich Village. So Rebecca, when do you find time to sleep? Well, I'm really excited to be here talking about infant sleep, and I have to say I do think probably the number one important thing to do if you want to get your infant to sleep is to at least try to sleep yourself. It's pretty hard, but grab it where you can. Yes, I very much agree. Being a mom myself, sleep is key to sanity. Absolutely. <laughs> so I know we've got some folks watching us, and as people are tuning in, I just want to remind you, if you have questions, please comment. We'd love to hear from you, um, hear your experiences, and we can chime in with some Q&A at the end. So let's get started with um, hearing a bit about Mommy Bites. Absolutely. So. Mommy Bites is a company that's been around for over 12 years, actually. We started out as a very grassroots community that basically connected moms with experts on a variety of parenting topics. And we did it in, in New York City over luncheons, and it would be an expert, a mom, and a lunch. That's how we got our name, Mommy Bites. Over the years, we've transitioned a little bit, but we still have maintained true to that same mission of just trying to help moms navigate through what can be a really fun and the most special you know, time in your life, but also so tricky and scary and new. And we found that you know, in today's world, a lot of people don't live right next door to their mom and their grandma and their aunts. And you know, they don't have a million people just kind of pitching in and teaching them and helping, ha helping them learn how to be a parent. So we, we still do some in-person events in New York City, but um, we've really transitioned to doing a lot of online parenting classes. We do some webinars, and we have an extensive library of parenting articles, but our sort of um, premier property that makes us different from a lot of other companies out there is we do teleclasses where an expert will call in and one of our team members will facilitate a conversation, not unlike this one, that is starts kind of on a phone call situation where moms can click in from their computer, or they can call in from their phone, they can ask questions, they can type in questions, and then the recording of that call becomes a podcast that lives on our site, and it's just a resource to, like I said, help help moms navigate through this, this tricky time of life. So um, obviously of all the parenting issues that are tricky in the first year, you know, there are many, breastfeeding and uh, a whole host of others, but sleep is probably the one that people are, I think, in my personal experience as a mom and also in my history of being with Mommy Bites, that it is just the key thing that moms stress out about, myself included, for sure. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, <laughs> I have, I should have mentioned, I don't think I did, I have a seven-year-old daughter, a five-year-old daughter, and then a one-year-old son. So, right when my husband and I were kind of in the clear and everyone was sleeping through the night and actually even in school all day, we thought, huh, maybe we'll try for one more. <laughs> spent the last year figuring out the whole sleep thing all over again because as we'll chat about over the course of this um, discussion, every child is so different. So you're sort of relearning uh, you know, each time, I think. I don't know if you experience that with your kids, but definitely Absolutely. differently. And every time you think you've got it figured out, something throws you for a loop. <laughs> Absolutely. So for those first time parents out there expecting baby number one, before a baby arrives, what tips do you have for planning ahead and making sure that everyone is ready for a good night's sleep? You know, there are a lot of things you can do as you're pregnant and it's hard because I think when you're pregnant, you know, 
you're really focused on your pregnancy and taking care of yourself and making sure you're growing the baby okay, you know, working out your birth plan, thinking about your registry. So, so sometimes you don't think about like, there's going to be an actual baby in my house that <laughs> I need to figure out how to get to sleep. Um, but if you can, and this is certainly with the perspective of having three kids, if you can think about it, there are certainly some things you can do. Um, number one, I think it's a good idea to interview pediatricians while you're pregnant so that you can be ready to go for that per first appointment when your baby's a few days old. And in the process of interviewing pediatricians, sleep is something you can certainly talk to them about, you know, get their advice on it, ask them what they think about swaddling, which we'll talk about more, and, you know, nursery and how, how the nursery should be, um, you know, outfitted for a baby to have the best sleep environment. So my first piece of advice would be talk to, talk to your pediatrician, because I think that's good advice for any parenting problem or question that you have. Um, the next piece of advice, I think, would be, you know, read some. There, there's a lot of reading material out there on um how to get to babies to sleep. And actually there are a lot of different perspectives and different point of views. And as you and I were talking about earlier, each child is different. So you may, you may read one book and think, that's great, I'm gonna do that. And you know, how, how lucky could you be if that works for your child? And it may, uh, but it might be a good idea even to read a, a couple of books. And so you have, you know, you're armed with a little bit more information on some different strategies. Um, you know, the other thing I think you can do is um, as you are, whether you're registering or, you know, figuring out what kind of gear that you need. A lot of people are thinking of the car seat and the stroller and the crib and all that's very important. But you can also think about how will the nursery be a place that's most um, suitable for an infant to sleep. And some things that might help that um, are, OK, one, to make it dark. So if you happen to live like we live in New York City in an apartment that has a lot of natural light. And that is so great for an adult um, when you're thinking, I don't want to live in a concrete jungle. It's not so great for an infant who's trying to sleep. So my actually with our first child, my husband and I looked into darkening shades, but then we weren't sure if, if we wanted to go down that route or, you know, how, how our baby would sleep. So we actually put black trash bags and taped them to the window behind our curtains. You couldn't even see them, but they made a big difference. And then as our daughter got older, we took them down. Because of course, as you grow up, you need to learn to sleep and not be complete pitch black. But that was, I think, something that was a big help. Um, you do what it takes. <laughs> exactly. Well, certainly get darkening shades if you can. But you know, sometimes you're just sort of thinking, oh, we've got to fix this problem right away. But we <laughs> did not do that before the baby was born. We did that as a, as a quick fix after. <laughs> um, a sound machine is another good one, especially if you're in a city or if you're in a house with other children, or even if you're just, you know, two adults. I mean, you may be making noise that you never realize walking down the hall or shutting the door and having it click. A sound machine can be re really helpful in that scenario. Um, a sound machine can also be helpful because, you know, you picture where the baby is coming from, such a, a warm, cozy, and actually loud place, but loud in a comforting way. You know, the mother's heartbeat is right there. Um, a lot of people use the word, the term fourth trimester for the baby. You know, the first three months when the baby is out of the womb, they're still thinking, gosh, I wish I was in there. That was a lot, a lot cozier and a lot easier of a place to sleep. So um, a sound machine can help with that. I mean, if some of the sound machines just have, have white noise or other sorts of noise, some of them actually have like the mother's heartbeat, you know, imitated sound. And so that can be a good thing to think about too. Um, and I think the last thing I would recommend in, in the nursery is, is trying to get a nightlight because, you know, if you have finally gotten your baby to sleep, the last thing you want to do is trip over something on your own way out the door. So you can put it around the corner or on the other side of the room or something, but something to make it easy for you to get it in and out while you're checking on your baby. I, I found that to be really helpful as well. Those are great tips. I know myself, my kids are five and three and they're still using that heartbeat sound machine <laughs> every night. Yep, same. Same with my older children too. Mm -hmm. We even travel with something like it, so. Absolutely. And the pediatrician is the absolute best resource. I feel like in that first year with my first little one, I was in that office every week. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you just need an ear to listen to, to know that you're not crazy and you're not alone and you're not you know, the only one going through these issues. If you've got a colicky baby or a fussy baby or a baby that won't stop crying, it is great reassurance. It's totally true. I think, you know, you have to realize, and, and for me, it's funny because I've, with all three of my children, I, I might have thought, well, this time I'm not going to go back to the pediatrician quite as much as before, <laughs> but you do because it's, you know, this, this little tiny child is, is in your, in the, in the care of you. And so I think it's nice to have a pediatrician who you feel comfortable asking anything to, because they've seen it before. That's why they chose this profession and, mm -hmm. and they, they usually know what to do, even if, like you said, it's just making you feel better. Yeah. So what are some of the things that helped you right away when you came home from the hospital to help calm your babies? So a couple things. Um, one thing that was really helpful to me and certainly to many moms out there is learning how to swaddle. And you can actually do that in the hospital. Um, all the nurses in the hospital are experts at swaddling. And um, if you haven't had a chance to learn before, I would say try to start practicing in the hospital. I know when we came home, um, I had, had three C-sections for various reasons. Um, and so I was a little bit out of it in the hospital, but we came home and my husband had been practicing with the nurses so uh -huh. much that he was the swaddle expert at first. And then I, I quickly learned because, again, talking about how babies are coming from such a warm and cozy place, a swaddle can really mimic that. So I would say learning to swaddle and, and practicing that, um, you know, practicing it and, and doing it, even if the baby sort of seem like, oh, they don't like it or they don't, it feels weird to put their arms in, you know, most babies do ultimately like it and it really can calm them down. So that would be uh, my number one piece of advice on what can you do right when you get home. Number two, and this is a little more surreal and less concrete, but I think, you know, you have to realize that it's so hard to, like I said at the beginning of this chat, it's hard to get your baby to sleep if you are totally sleep deprived. Now you are going to be sleep deprived for sure. I mean, it's just, it's like a new normal in terms of the amount of sleep you're going to get. But what I would say is if you're lucky enough to have any help and whether that help comes in the form of your mom or your husband or your mother-in-law or a babysitter or a friend or anybody, take it. Um, because it's scary feeling like you're so tired that you can't work on getting your baby to sleep. So I think, you know, sometimes we think we want to be super mom and do it all and, and great for somebody who can do it all. Um, but, it, you know, of course, you're not going to get as much sleep as you did. But I would say take as much help as you can right off the bat. So free. Yeah. I remember when my friends used to come and visit baby for the first time, they'd show up and within five minutes, I'd say, oh, okay, great. I'm going to go shower. I'm going to catch some quick Z's while you're here and take advantage of it. I mean, even just a short, even just showering or lying down for a minute or, you know, doing whatever it is you need to do to, to feel like yourself again. Put on some mm -hmm. plus, you know, yes. <laughs> walk outside. Take a mental health break. Yeah, exactly. All good. So as a mom, I know that sleep habits can change drastically. As baby grows, all it takes is a tooth, a cold, one night off routine, or in my case, daylight savings time. Yeah. <laughs> so what tips do you have for those transitional phases in the first 12 months? You know, I think the thing that is most important to think about, I was mentioning before, maybe if you could possibly read a few different books or get some different advice so that you're armed with all the different tools so that, right, like you said, right when you think one thing's working, something changes. And when something changes, you either, you can go back to everything you've tried and see if that still works, or alternately, you can try something new. So um, a lot of moms may have heard of the five S's that have become kind of um, popular in terms of ways to soothe a new baby. And over the different, you know, when you first get home, the baby's sleeping so much, Sometimes, unless you have a colicky baby, it's almost not as hard at first, I think. I mean, you're still sleep deprived and you're still going through the crazy hormonal transitions, but the baby actually often will eat, sleep, eat, sleep, eat, sleep, you know, and then it's like, as they wake up a little more, it's like, well, then you have to get them back to sleep. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe you were nursing them to sleep before, maybe you were feeding them a bottle, whatever. So I always like to go back to sort of the basics. The five S's worked really well 
you know, intermittently over time, I would say they made more work than they didn't. And just for anybody who isn't totally familiar with what those are, we spoke about one of them already at Swaddle. Um, another one of the five S's is suck, as in on a pacifier. Um, or, you know, certainly eating and breastfeeding and bottle feeding can be part of that. But the, the sucking motion is calming for a lot of babies. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are scared of pacifiers. That's okay. If you don't want to use them, that is absolutely your decision. My personal opinion and, and then with, from the experience with my three children is that they are a lifesaver and they become more of a lifesaver the older they get. Now, obviously, eventually at some point you want to get rid of them and people are nervous about that, but you know, that can happen. There's so many different strategies to get rid of them and having done it two so far, and I've got one more in my future where I've got, got to get rid of it. I, I think it's doable. I think what's, What's nice about it, in fact, our son, who's one, wasn't really, he didn't really take to the pacifier too much. And my husband and I, knowing how great it was with our daughters, just kept introducing it, kept giving it to him, kept giving it to him. Now he loves it. And it really is one of those things that when nothing else will soothe him, it sometimes does. And, you know, there's a lot of research behind that. Um, another one of the S's is the shh. And that sound is just... Um, kind of to mimic the heartbeat again, to make them feel like it's a consistent sound. It's also a consistent sound that different people can make. Um, and, you know, you can actually do it pretty loudly. Um, there are certain modes on the sleep machines and the noise machines that sound like a shh. Um, but it's another thing that's been proven to really calm babies. The, the last two are side, side slash some stomach, because they're supposed to sleep on their side or their stomachs these days to avoid um, SIDS related um, crises. And then the other one is swing, swinging them to get them to sleep. So I would say um, as the, you know, to go back to your original question, as they're transitioning through other transitions, those were my tactics, or those were the tactics that were taught to me that I always went back to. But you can also find your own, you know, if you had sort of something that worked before, try it again. If it didn't, look for another resource because there's so many different strategies to, to calm sleeping babies. Mm -hmm. I remember that first year of sway, I would catch myself doing the motion without holding baby. <laughs> I'd get baby oh, down to sleep and I'd still be swaying. Absolutely. I, yeah, I couldn't Thanks agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in your opinion, is it important to change what baby wears to sleep as they grow the first few months? You know, I think so. I mean, they come home from the hospital and they're just these little teeny nuggets and they fit into a swaddle that's made by, you know, a lot of people, myself included, use the hospital blankets to swaddle them. Even like, I don't know, six weeks down the line, if you look at a baby and try to swaddle them in one of those hospital blankets, they are those blankets already seem so tiny. And so, you know, maybe you'll move up to a bigger swaddle blanket. And there are many, many out there, depending on the time of year and the season and where you live and what kind of material you like, but I think what you transition to first is just a swaddle blanket, but a bigger one. Um, then maybe as they're moving around a little bit more and you feel like, well, I've got to give them a little room. There's some swaddle blankets that aren't, aren't you know, you kind of do the swaddle for you, whether it's a Velcro or a, you know, tie or whatever. And those are nice. First of all, they they help with your own sleep a little bit because maybe you can come on and, you know, come in the room, just kind of refix it and put them back to sleep and um, without having to actually take them out and re-swaddle them. Um, and then they're also nice because it gives them maybe a little bit of wiggle room as they're getting older to move around. Um, and then, you know, as they get even older, there's some swaddle blankets that are that swaddle the bottom and let their arms out or, you know, there are lots of different things. You can, no, nothing works. No, there's no one path for every baby. A lot of it is how they're how they are growing and how they're sleeping and what you feel is right for them. You uh, you know I, I do want to mention you obviously always want to talk to your pediatrician about anything you're using. Make sure it's safe and in, in, in a safe creating a safe environment for your baby to sleep. Um, certainly no blankets. They all you know they would need to be like like zip ups or or velcro or whatever it is um, until they're well out of the phase of of any um, potential risk. But there are, uh, you know, it's nice to, I, my son is just about to turn one next week and it's nice to see uh -huh. him at the phase where, you know, he's really moving around and he can stand up in his crib at the end of it. And that's because we've sort of little by little allowed him to have a little more wiggle room. Um, so yeah, I think those are, those are sort of the, the, the transitions of what they actually sleep in. 
over the first really year. Nice, thank you. And so you've experienced this twice now, bringing a new sibling into the household. And sometimes, you know, parents are, they're not only sharing a house, they're sharing the same room. So what is your advice for adding a new sibling and how that can impact sleep? Well, I will say this is something that I, I don't even know if I, what I'll give more than my advice is my experience, because I think every kid is so different. And um, sometimes it's really helpful to have other siblings around uh, other the next day. It may not be. But um, <laughs> for us, we had when my second daughter was born, my first daughter was two and they shared a room. Um, but for a while, it was just completely fine because the baby would sort of sleep through most stuff. And our two year old was pretty much sleeping through the night other than, you know, like you mentioned before, other than some random thing would happen like daylight savings. <laughs> but for the most part. <laughs> It actually worked and then it, it started being tricky when the baby got to the point that my two-year-old being up would wake her up. And mm -hmm. she also was still in a crib, the two-year-old. And so she'd get up and she'd want to get out of her crib and she would be playing in it. And <laughs> my husband and I were like, hmm, I really wish we had an extra bedroom right now. But I think my best advice, um, and this goes with our third child too, is to try to create a routine for all of your kids and try to stick to it as much as possible. So um, we haven't really talked about bedtime routines yet as part of this discussion, but you know, once the baby starts getting to the, the age where they're out of that like teeny, teeny, teeny infant stage, you can start doing things like reading to them and, and we can sing to them anytime. You can read to them anytime, but I think you can start doing those things immediately and they, they will never remember a time when that wasn't a part of their going to bed. And for us, I think that's helpful because, you know, we had a, a six and a four year old when our infant was born last year. And then we said, you know, we have a bedtime routine and, you know, your bedtime routine can be whatever you want it to be. You know, for us, it's a couple books, a couple songs, a prayer, a good bed, whatever, whatever yours is. I think if you do it, then they expect it. And then there's sort of like, you know, less room for them to not not think it's happening. Now, I certainly won't say that my five-year-old doesn't come out of her bed after they've gone to bed, you know, every now and then and say, I'm hungry, I need to go to the bathroom. I mean, you know, five years in and we still have that happen all the time. But I think routine, routine, routine is the best thing you can do with one baby for sure. But you have a little more flexibility with one. Once mm -hmm. you have multiples, it's, it's just so helpful to have them expect what's coming. Absolutely. Always adding new things and learning new things and they grow and there's just new challenges to figure out, it seems. 100%. So any final tips for sleep in the first year? You know, I, I think I would just want to go back to what I started with, which is baby sleep. There is no one answer to it. There are a lot of different tools that you can put in your mental toolbox and reach for when you feel like you're at your wit's end. Um, so educate yourself would be my number one tip. And number two, try, try, try to take care of yourself. Cause if you're not rested, your baby will probably never sleep. Right. Absolutely. So in a moment, we're going to open it up to Q and a, um, hopefully everyone has had a chance that's watching to post some comments and some questions. Um, give us a like, or tell us what's worked for you. What hasn't, um, what you'd like to hear from Rebecca. Um, before we get to q and I'd like to take a moment to um, talk a little bit again about Mommy Bites and for Rebecca to let us know where, where our viewers can go to learn more about Mommy Bites and what it is that you do. Absolutely. There are a lot of different ways to connect with Mommy Bites. First of all, our main point of contact with our community is our weekly newsletter. And so if you go on our site, sign up for our weekly newsletter, you just put your email in, we will add you to our list and we'll share with you um, a lot of tips on various parenting topics such as sleep that we've been talking about today. Um, we also have um, some active social media channels. On Facebook, we are Mommy Bites. On Twitter, we're Mommy Bites. And on Instagram, we are Mommy Bites Parenting. So we love to connect. We have a wonderful community of moms all over the country. And, you know, we want to keep doing what we've been doing for over a decade, which is helping moms navigate through the tricky transition of becoming a parent. Absolutely. Okay, so Rebecca, <laughs> here we go. 
Um, what is the biggest sleep fail that one parent can commit in the baby's first year? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a really tough one because I think everybody, every kid is so different. I, you know, I have seen it happen so many times where people will become first time parents. They will su subscribe to one specific sleep, you know, um, sort of suggestion and it'll work and they'll say, oh my gosh, this is what everyone should do. It always works. And then they'll have a second kid and it won't work at all. Um, so I think that's just, you know, that's, it's tricky to say what's the biggest fail because um, it, what works for one kid may work for another kid. Right. Um, so another question, do you have any recommendations for sleep and travel by car? Um, yeah, you know, well, one recommendation is that a lot of babies just sleep well in the car. So, um, certainly, um, so others, others don't, but I think it, it depends on the age a little bit. I mean, again, the biggest recommendation I would give is make sure, um, that whatever car seat you're using is age appropriate for your baby and, you know, that you're whatever, any blankets that you're using or any additional um, products that you're using are all safe. Um, but I think the biggest thing for sleep in the car is, you know, stick with your um, routine, whatever routine you're on. And if you're, you know, if you're still breastfeeding, don't hesitate to, to stop and pull over. And also just don't, don't stress out about it too much. Babies, if, if, if they get a little bit out of their routine, it's okay. And if you need to maybe put a little bit longer um, estimate on your trip, that, that may be what it has to be. Um, but you know, babies certainly travel in cars all the time and it, it is okay. And they, um, change their diaper consistently. Definitely. That would be another one. <laughs> Always a fresh dry diaper before getting in the car for a long ride. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So next question, I have a nine month old and I'm nursing. He no longer goes to sleep with me. Only dad. Is that common? You know, my first daughter on our first birthday would not let me hold her. She was in such a daddy phase. I think um, what I got really good advice from a friend of mine at that time, which said, which was, if your child is in a daddy phase, let let them be in that phase. And as we discussed before, go grab a quick shower or a nap and just try not to let it get to you because it, it does get to you. But um, if you can possibly remember that advice, because at some point they're going to be in a mommy only phase and you're going to just really want a quick break from your adorable child who you love. <laughs> um, that would be my best advice. It's definitely totally normal. Babies go in and out of these phases all the time and don't, don't worry about it. Agreed. Even as my children got older, they have days, weeks where all they want is me or my husband and you just try not to take it personal. Absolutely. <laughs> and enjoy it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so a follow up to the um, car uh, sleep question. Um, this viewer is noting that it's a 12 hour trip. So how can we give her some great tips for long journeys with infants? I, I think it depends a little bit on the age of the infant, but, you know, I would say for a 12 hour trip, kind of same as before, like break it up if you can. Um, also just for your own sanity and um, also, yeah, just make sure that you're staying on your routine as much as you can make them make sure that the baby is eating and the diapers are changed enough, make sure everything is safe, but you know, it, it just, just, just go, it's going to be fine. Yeah. And I was always mindful, too, of the temperature in the car, because what's cool for me or warm for me with baby, maybe bundled up in that car seat. If it's a little baby in a bucket seat, they might get hotter than you. Yeah. Sometimes you'll realize that when you get somewhere and then the baby's sweating. So absolutely. Yeah. That's a great that's a great tip as well. Absolutely. Um, so let's see here. What do we have? Um, side stomach lying is not recommended for safe sleep or SIDS. Is that correct? And did we did did I hear you say the opposite? Uh, no, so, uh, I didn't think so. <laughs> I did not. So, stomach is what is recommended. 
if I said something different, I was wrong. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, just watching the little bubbles. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. What am I? What am I saying? Some of what is not recommended. That I just said that completely wrong. Okay. okay. I wasn't gonna go against the expert. Back is wrong. <laughs> sorry. Back is best, right? That's what I said before. Back is best. <laughs> okay. Come on. Back is best. All right, everyone. Back is best. <laughs> What am I saying? Yeah. Are we sleep derived? <laughs> we might be sleep deprived. I know I am. My kids are getting up way too early. <laughs> yeah, maybe I said something wrong when I was doing the five S's. Swing. <laughs> Definitely not stomach. If I said that, ignore. Good <laughs> thing we have these viewers holding us accountable. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so waiting for a couple more questions to come in. What would you say is the most valuable piece of advice for um, sick babies or babies that are not feeling well and trying to keep up the routine but also allow time for extra cuddles um, and following baby's lead? You know, some moms do, are more babies, driven more by baby's lead. And I think in that scenario, you do have to just go with your gut as a parent um, on in certain things other than the safety issues like the one we just talked about, which I'm so sorry. I don't know why I said that. That was the absolute wrong thing to say. But um, in general, as long as you're following the safety issues, as long as you're making sure that your baby is fed enough, mm -hmm. um, and which you'll know if they're growing and you get, you get checked by your pediatrician so often early on, that um, if you are, if you subscribe to the idea of, you know, going more by what your baby is sort of seeming to want, as long as you run that by your pediatrician, I think, you know, if you want extra cuddles, if whatever it is, I think that that is your, you know, your choice to make. Great. Okay. Um, my son now rolls on his tummy, but does not like it. Throughout the night, he turns and cries a lot and wakes up every hour. Is there anything I can do to help him? You know, that is a tricky thing, because as we were just saying, tummy is, tummy is not where you want them to sleep anyway. But once they can turn over, there's not a lot you want to do. And then if they don't feel comfortable because they've been sleeping on their back because you've been training them to do that, it's tricky. I mean, I think it kind of that's one of the situations when it, what I did, at least, is just go in, turn them back over on their back, try to soothe them in whatever ways you have, pacifier, et cetera. And um Go from there. Sometimes it's going to be one of those situations where, like you and I were saying before, right when you think you have it, it's changed. You go back in, they might flip back over. You go back in again, he might flip over again. It's just, it's one of those things that is a tricky transition, but hopefully eventually they will, he'll figure out how to, how to be comfortable and not do that and stay asleep on his back. Great. And I know for myself, I always tried to introduce one new thing at a time. If I was trying out a new tip or something that I read in a book or someone recommended something to me, I wouldn't try a couple different things because then I would never know which one it was that was really making the difference. So just try one thing and incorporate one new new tip at a time and see what works for your baby. This particular little one was five months old, so he's probably at the point where he's flipping around and enjoying a little bit more independence. I think I said before, my baby just got to the point where he's standing up in his crib. And so then you get to the point where, well, so we had to lower the crib to make sure it was safe. And so mm -hmm. you're going to always hit those new transitions and just have to figure out how to keep them safe. But that's really good advice that you just gave, which is one, one thing at a time. Yeah. And you'll know what's working. Mother's intuition. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in. It's sort of slowed down. <laughs> we can breathe, take breath. <laughs> um, do you have anything that you want to add? I know that we've covered a lot. I just want to thank you guys for having me. I'm so happy to um, have had the chance to chat with you. I do want to reiterate that babies should definitely sleep on their back. I um, absolutely misspoke earlier, so I apologize for that. Um, no worries. Happy to be here, and I thank you so much for joining us. us. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. All right, everyone. We are tuning out. <laughs> In case anybody has any final questions, now's your chance. Um, thank you again, Rebecca Dixon from Mommy Bites. 
with some great, great expert advice on babies sleep in the first year. Um, as you're watching, if you have any questions, Rebecca, is there a way that um, viewers can contact you if they want to follow up after the video? To anybody, Rebecca at mommybites.com. And, you know, I'd love you to sign up for our, our newsletter or reach out to us on social media, but absolutely email me directly too. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.